Good morning, everybody. Glad to have some people in the sanctuary and some people on Zoom and uh, just happy that we could gather. I know it, it's tough to get up on today. We lost that hour of sleep and uh, I'm sure you all were up watching basketball late like I was and I'm sure we're just a little tired so we can just take a big stretch and deep breath and wake up. Um, I'm Pastor Will. If you don't know who I am, I've been here for a little bit. I'm the relatively new but not super new pastor here at St. Paul. Um, I'm glad that we could be together. A couple announcements. Uh, in your bulletins, if you're sitting here present, you probably will see a UMCOR envelope. Uh, this Sunday is the Global UMCOR Giving Sunday. Um, and so just to explain what UMCOR is, it stands for United Methodist Committee uh, or, uh, on Relief. And they are the, the kind of the disaster response arm of the United Methodist Church. They do a lot of really great work. Um, through the money that we pay in apportionments, that any donations to them go purely to relief. They don't go to overhead. They don't go to staff. They go to helping people in need. So right now, they're in Texas, Mississippi, helping people who experienced the worst of that big freeze a couple weeks ago. Um, they're, they're in places in South Asia after tsunamis. They're in uh, the South U.S. after hurricanes. Uh, they are international and local, and they do a lot of really great work. Uh, so if you'd like to give a donation to them, you can either put that do your donation in that envelope and leave it in the offering bin, and we'll know where it goes. Or you can take that envelope with you and use it as a reminder. Um, or if you're on Zoom, just after service, you can go to umcore.org, and there's a give button you can go to. Um, so feel free, uh, to, to if, if you feel so called and are able, to give to them. They're a really great organization. Um, our Sunday school resumes today. I'm glad to see some of our young worshipers are back and, and thankful for Leslie and for Melanie for helping get that set up and, and uh, very thankful for that. And we'll continue to do that as long as the numbers allow us to and as long as they continue to stay below 3%, I think that should be good. We, we should also note that on uh, April 3rd, the Saturday before Easter, at 10 a.m., we're going to do an Easter egg hunt for families in the field right next to the church. So feel free to invite friends. It'll be outside. It'll be distanced. Uh, it'll be a great thing uh, to invite uh, people to. We're going to have a sign-up. I'm putting the sign-up up today. Uh, An RSVP just helps us make sure we have enough candy and eggs for anyone who might come. So if you, if you invite someone, please encourage them to RSVP. I'll send out that link, that link this afternoon. Um, because we are worshiping in person, we are having, if anyone would like to usher, uh, some of you saw, saw Mary Jean and Patty today doing a great job checking temperatures, helping show people where seats are. Uh, you're welcome to, to, to contact uh, Miss Joanne or myself uh, to get on that rotation. And if you'd like to learn the tech that we do for OBS and Zoom to make uh, the live stream happen, feel free to let us know. Uh, and, I, and we can teach you and get you in the rotation there as well. Um, looking ahead, I'm, uh, we're going to be doing a joint worship service with Salem UMC for Maundy Thursday and for Good Friday. I'm going to be talking with Pastor Emily uh, sometime in the next week to get those planned, but you can go ahead and mark those on your calendar. I, I assume our Maundy Thursday service will be in the evening around 6.30 or 7, and I don't know when our Good Friday service typically happens, So, but hopefully by the end of the week I'll have time for that, uh, times for that. Um, I believe those are all the announcements. We are still collecting donations for uh, Laytonsville Havens, and the room is starting to fill up with great stuff for them. We're thankful for people who have donated. I didn't know, Leslie, was, if there was anything else I should m mention about that? Awesome. And for those on Zoom who couldn't hear, Leslie just said thank you to everyone. Uh, we're really appreciative. So we still have a few more weeks that we're collecting. Feel free to bring those by on Saturday. Or if you need to find another time, just contact me and I'll, I'll meet you at the church. Uh, those are all the announcements I have. Are there any announcements from the room or from Zoom? Great. Pastor Will? Yes. Yeah, hi, it's Chris. Um, just FYI, other ways to give to UMCOR or any other special um, needs is you can also mail a check to our P.O. box and you can give through uh, online through Tithely on our website, stpaullatonsville.org. All you need to do in each case is have a separate check or a separate contribution and make a note of what it's for. In this case, it would be disaster relief, and we'll make sure it gets to UMCOR. 
Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Did everyone in here hear that well enough? Great. Awesome. <laughs> Any other last announcements before we begin our time of worship this morning? All right, let's just take a moment and, and center ourselves. We can take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. And we'll prepare for our call to worship. If you're present, it's in the bulletin. If, if, if you're on Zoom, it'll, it'll pop up on the screen here. Light has entered the world. Rejoice. Light is God's gift to each and to all together. Give thanks to God. For days of watchful care, the steadfast love of God endures forever. Let those whom God has redeemed rejoice. Let them tell the world of God's good news. We will thank God for wonderful works. We will rejoice in God's love for all humankind. By God's word, we are delivered from destruction. By God's mercy, we are healed and made whole. Our voices will join in songs of joy. Our lives will offer sacrifices of thanksgiving. Amen. I'm going to hand it over to Melanie, who's on Zoom, but she's going to tell our kids' story. So Melanie will be on, be on this big speaker. Good morning, everybody. I apologize. <laughs> I am on Zoom this morning. Tomorrow is my first day of school back, and I think a lot of other friends are also coming back to school, so there's a lot to do. And this is good practice for me because I'm going to have some children on Zoom, and I'm going to have some children in my classroom. So I am going to do the best I can to share with you my children's story. So the first thing that I'm going to share with you is a sound. So hopefully you'll be able to hear this. Were you able to hear that a little bit? Well, it's one of, I think it's a parent's nightmare and a teacher's nightmare, but it's also a, a wonderful thing for parents and teachers. It's called Velcro. And if you're a teacher and all our shoes, a lot of our kids' shoes have Velcro on them and you can take them apart and put them back together pretty easily. But we're gonna use our Velcro today with this for a story because we're in the season of Lent. And one of the things that we do in Lent is we learn or we remember about Jesus's life and what this particular part of his life was important because he was preparing to die for us and he needed to die for us for all the sins that had been developed in the world. So one of the reasons why he died, well, not one of them, the major reason why Jesus died was to to save us from our sin. So uh, we're gonna use our Velcro today and I'm gonna do it one more time so maybe you can hear it. Okay, and I have a piece of ribbon, all right? And I'm gonna put one of my pieces of Velcro on one end. So now that I have the piece of Velcro on the end of my ribbon, I'm gonna think of this as Jesus. The other part of my ribbon doesn't have any Velcro on it, but that's going to be, we're going to pretend that's us. Okay, so we have Jesus on one side, and we have us on the other side. One side has Velcro, the other side does not. So when I put them together, will they stick? Probably not, because I don't have the other part. When I take my other piece of Velcro and attach it to the other side of my, of my ribbon, our side, and we put it together, it sticks together. So the reason why I did this is because a lot of people feel that they, you know, they're going to go to heaven no matter what. So they don't put their Velcro part on their end. They don't try to reach out to God and Jesus. They don't try to do good things. They don't try to follow the rules. They think that just because they're around, they're going to go to heaven. But Jesus, he always has that Velcro part. He's always there to, 
to catch us no matter what. He's always there to love us. He's there to help us make good decisions. He forgives us if we make bad decisions. So in order for us to receive God's love, we just have to have that little Velcro strip on the end of our ribbon. We just need to have, be open and willing to let him help us. Because when it sticks together, it's so much better than just, be, just being hanging there. So hopefully that story made sense. And hopefully you were able to understand what I was trying to say. So let's just say a little prayer before you go to Sunday school. Okay. Dear Lord, help us remember that we need to also reach out to you and have to have our Velcro piece in order for our, your love to help us. Help us know that when we believe in you, we can do anything. People who don't know Jesus can still find Jesus through us. Help us attach their Velcro to their ribbon so that they can be part of your love as well. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Melanie. So now if any of our young worshipers want to go with Leslie for Sunday school, she's going to go down the fellowship hall. It sounds like they got a, a fun day planned down there. So we come to the time of our worship where we accept any prayer requests, any joys, concerns. Uh, we want to lift up Joanne, the office administrator of St. Paul, her family this week. They, they lost she lost a cousin that she was really close to in the fall, and then her cousin's husband passed away this week, and she was at the funeral yesterday. So we want to keep Joanne and Paul and their family in our prayers this week. Any other prayer requests? And if you're on Zoom, feel free to just uh, just say them out, because I can't see anyone. So. Well, it's funny. Yep. Jack is having more pains. Um, we, like we discussed on Thursday, mm. finally yeah. called the doctor this morning. So hopefully he'll get some meds to help help him. But. Of course. So we'll keep Jack in our prayer. Thank you. Of course. Yeah, Mary Jean. Yeah, we'll keep Liz in our prayers, of course, and your whole family too. I'm sure. Yes, Miss Jeanette. I think it would be nice to have prayers for all the school uh, administrators, teachers, and and for the children and the parents uh, to uh, give them a a good prayer. That's yeah. I'm gonna restate that just because I want to make sure Zoom heard. But but uh, Miss Jeanette was talking about praying for our, our schools, our teachers, our administrators, all the different uh, uh, education uh, uh, leaders who are and parents and, and the kids who are preparing to go back or stay home. Uh, and, and yeah, we're gonna we're gonna lift them up. So for and for Montgomery County, which I think is going back this week in a lot of places, and for other places as well. But we're gonna lift up. Uh, our, our teachers. And I want to restate Mary Jean's just so Zoom heard. Uh, we're going to be praying for Mary Jean's sister, Liz, uh, who is uh, being tested for a spot on her lung this week and, and lift her up in prayer. Other prayer requests from Zoom or in person? I'll add, since it is UMCOR Sunday, we can lift up all the ministries of UMCOR, but uh, I have a friend in Texas who just got power and plumbing back this week she's been without plumbing for uh for at least two weeks and she has a child and and she's two kids and uh it's been really stressful so prayers for the south southwest and and those who are affected by the freeze and, and umcor and other groups that are trying to do help down there any other prayer requests okay, 
Can we take a moment and go to God in prayer together? God, who today we read loved the world, who loved the world so much that you came and lived among us, we pray for that world, for those who feel that you may be far off or who may just be struggling or stressed or going through a tough time. God, we lift up those who are sick, who are seeking healing. God, we pray for Joanne, uh, for, for Jack, and that you would be with his doctors and help them to treat him and take away the pain he is experiencing, and we lift him up to you, God. God, we lift up Liz. We pray for a good report, and we pray for the doctors and nurses to know how best to care for her, pray for her family in this time of uncertainty, that you would give them peace, that they could that they could join around her in love and, and, and encourage and comfort her in this time. And we just lift her up to you, God. And we pray for, for, for her test this week, and we lift her up. God, we pray for those who are experiencing loss, those we know and don't know who are hurting this week because someone they love is no longer with them. We pray for Joanne and Paul and their family as they, as they mourn the loss of a cousin who they love dearly. God, that the people around them could comfort them, that they would feel your presence mourning that loss of life with them, but they could also hear the echo of resurrection, that death does not have the final word. So God, we pray for comfort, we pray for a space for mourning, and we pray for hope in those circumstances. God, we pray for the schools that are going back. We pray for each student, for their parents, who I'm sure are mixed with excitement for their children to go back, but also worried. We pray for teachers and administrators and school counselors, all those who care and help our kids grow and help protect them. We just pray for guidance and peace, that as inevitably things will continue to shift and change, that you would give them peace. We pray for safety for them. God, that you would just be with our school system this week as they go back. And for those who are staying online, we pray for them too, Lord. God, be with all of our teachers and students and all those who are in that very important process. We lift them up, God. God, we pray on, on this Sunday and, and every day we pray for those who are affected by disaster for our siblings in Texas and Mississippi and other parts of the South who may still be without water or electricity. We lift them up and pray for relief, that you would guide the organizations and the people trying to help to the places where it is needed most, the places that might be overlooked. God, that you would guide policymakers and other leaders to making decisions to help protect people not just in the short term, but in the long term as well, God. We lift up all those who are affected by disaster, whether it be a freeze, an earthquake, displacement, any number of things. And God, open our eyes to the ways that we can be love and grace to them. God, we pray for all those on our prayer list. We lift up Michael Hitchcock as he continues to heal, and we pray you be with him and the Hitchcock family, Miss Nancy, that you would bring healing to Michael and help him feel stronger and help his back feel better. God, today, open our eyes to the ways you are moving, to the beauty you surround us with, but to your presence in all things the God who mourns in our mourning, who rejoices in our joy, and who loves us in the midst of every circumstance. And we pray with the confidence that your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'll invite Miss Jeanette forward to read our scripture. The first reading this morning <clears throat> is from Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. From Mount Or, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The second reading is from Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were, by nature, children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what we have has made us, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Thanks be to God for these words.
Our gospel reading today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 13 through 21. Let's open our hearts to the Word of God. No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and the people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the word of God for the people of God. And we can say, thanks be to God. Would you all pray with me? God, open our eyes to the presence of a loving God in our life. And open our eyes to those things that wedge, put a wedge between us and you. Do not let us become comfortable, God, in the places that, that keep us from you. But by your Holy Spirit, give us an adventurous faith to step out, to journey towards your kingdom and towards your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Some of you may know this, in fact, I bet most of you do, that this week and the past couple weeks, many of us surpassed a milestone with the pandemic. For many of us, it has been one year since we went into lockdown or we started social distancing restrictions. I know things were a little different up here than they were in Florida this time last year, and and there was kind of some phasing in and out. But it's been one year since all of our plans got canceled. There was a music festival I really wanted to go to in in, uh, Chattanooga that got canceled this year. It's been one year since everything shut down. It's been one year since we all became experts in droplets and masks and Zoom meetings. We, at the time, probably had difficulty imagining how we would survive lockdown. But over the year, we've adapted, and dare I say, we've become comfortable with some parts of our new normal. Obviously, there's a lot of things we don't like. I'd love to not have to wear a mask. But there are some things that that I'm beginning to get comfortable with. We may miss our coworkers, we may miss being in an office setting, but there are perks to being able to go to meetings in our jammies and being able to not drive into the office. I've had a couple of conversations with friends where I leave worrying that when we finally can be free of COVID-19 life, they may not want to be. We, despite not wanting to, have found in some places our security in this quarantine life, and we may not be ready for the new phase that comes next. I know as much as I miss being able to go into class with friends and sit in the same room and talk with people, I'm not looking forward to the 50-hour commute into D.C. for classes during the week and the 50-hour commute back, usually during heavy traffic times. It would be comfortable 
I would be comfortable if I just preached on John 3.16 today. And John 3.16 is a great verse. Many of us probably know it by heart. Before I even read it, you knew what I was about to say. But it's also a verse that should never be cliche to us. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That is a beautiful piece of scripture. But if I chose today just to preach on this verse, I would be choosing what was comfortable for a sermon rather than to address the elephant in the room, the numbers passage that Jesus references. Now, we read the numbers passage earlier. I thank you, Miss Jeanette, for reading that. And I don't think it's unfair to say it is a weird story. It is the weirdest story, and it's, and it's this little bit of a story in Numbers compared to the rest of the book. It's only five verses. God sends snakes into the Israelite caravan, and when people get bit, God then tells Moses to fashion a snake on a pole and to cure the poison of the snake bite that people have to look at the snake on a pole. That is a weird story. Can we just sit, accept that for a moment? That is a weird story. And so I have to wonder as I stand here, not what that story means for the grand history of Christianity, but what does that story mean for us who sit here, who have things like antivenom, who hear that story and think, that is a weird story. And I think I find the most important part of the number story is actually at the beginning, when the people complain and they say, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. First, can we just look at this contradiction? There's there's no food, but we detest this miserable food. I wonder if anyone here has ever tried to offer vegetables to a hungry toddler and have the toddler say no and complain that they're hungry and that they're starving and that you, the parent who's trying to give them the vegetables, are trying to starve them, but you're just sitting there with a container full of broccoli or grapes or carrots That's the Israelites right now. They say, there's no food, and we don't like this miserable food that you sent from the heavens. And they claim there's no water, but the story just before this one is where Moses strikes the rock, and the river comes flowing out, and they can drink the water from the rock. So I think what's really going on here is the beginning of the complaint. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? That's a constant thread throughout the journey of, of the Israelites from Egypt to the Promised Land. Why? Did God save us from Egypt? The true poison in the community represented by the snakes is that the Israelites desire to return to the security and the misery of Egypt. Let's be clear, the journey is difficult. They do hunger. They do go against enemies time and again in their time in the desert. They have to move through the wilderness, which just doesn't sound like a lot of fun unless it's like, you know, a path through the wood that's been set for you. They're in the unpredictable place between what they know and where they are told they want to be. But there has been one point of predictability in their journey. When they're hungry, God has fed them. When they're thirsty, God makes water run from the the rock. God has been with them and God has kept them through this grand adventure to the promised land. I wonder if the snakes expose the deadliness of the community that was too secure in their past life in Egypt. Their desire to return, instead of taking the adventure of God of God's into the promised land, to return to Egypt rather than to take the mantle of the call that's been placed upon them. For all the injustice and evil, even for their own existence in Egypt, the Israelites time and again want to go back. It might have been awful, but it was comfortable. They knew what to expect. And so Moses fashions a snake on a pole, and the the snake can heal them from the snakes that punish them. Now, first, just to clarify, the Israelites are not worshiping this image of a snake, though I could see why we would think that. But that would be idolatry. That's a big no-no. In Numbers, it says so. But what commentators say is that when the Israelites look at the snake's image, they are reminded of the poison of their own complaint. They see the reason that their community is poisoned and they are healed. The the snake statue has no power, but the power it has is how it reminds the Israelites that they are prone to reject the call of God out of Egypt. It heals them by this power. The snake reminds them of this power, that God is calling them out of their comfort. 
So what does the snake lifted in the wilderness have to do with the Son of God sent in the world, not to condemn it, but to save it? Why does Jesus, of all the Hebrew scripture he could have quoted in this moment, why does Jesus quote these very brief five verses in Numbers? And I wonder if Jesus is trying to illustrate some of the harder parts of his teaching from this story. Jesus says, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people love darkness, which would be, they would consider rather than light because their deeds were evil. That Jesus has come into the world and he knows what's about to happen. The judgment, the reminder is that God comes in love to a world that is too comfortable being Egypt, too comfortable living in death to enjoy the gift of grace. In Lent, we as Christians are journeying towards Easter, towards the celebration that death has no power, but we are also journeying towards the cross. In John, Jesus often says that he must be lifted up as a way of describing the cross, and this is kind of a counter expectation that John is setting up, that the Messiah is not lifted up as an honored, but the Messiah is killed and put to death on a cross, that that is his glory, is the death on the cross. And in this passage, Jesus is connecting his death on the cross with the serpent that Jesus lifts in the desert. The cross is a funny thing for Christians to carry with them. It's funny that we adorn our churches, our jewelry, even our bodies, and I was going to wear a short sleeve shirt so you could see my tattoo, with images of the cross. What God or even person would want their followers to wear the sign of their death at all times. One comedian says that when Jesus comes back, he's going to be scared away because Christians just are walking around with, his, with, with the cross on them. But I wonder if Jesus sees the connection between the cross and the serpent because the cross reminds us that the world that we are tempted to be comfortable in would choose death rather than life. Last week, we said that when we follow Jesus, flipping tables is always an option. We also need to recognize that when we live in a world committed to evil, that death on a cross is always an option for someone who's innocent. The cross reminds us not to be comfortable with the world as it is, because the world as it is is willing to kill the Son of God who came in love and grace. The cross reminds us that our love for Egypt is poison. Now, I want to clarify, Jesus does love the world. It says that in John 3, 2, right next to these verses. So there is a distinction we should make between our love of the world and our love for the world. Our love of the world leads us to accept the comfort and convenience of where we're at rather than where we can be in the kingdom of God, the place that Jesus invites us to join, the adventure that Jesus invites us to be part of. Our love of Egypt or of the world makes us wish we were toiling rather than marching towards the promised land. Because at least we understand where we're at now. But our love for the world compels us to join a Jesus who comes not to condemn, but to love and to save the world. Our love for the world invites us to, into the adventure of faith that asks us to to, to bring in the kingdom of God and, its tran- and transform parts of the world that are still comfortable in death, to bring life to places that are comfortable with death. So this Lent, as we journey towards Jesus on the cross, as we hear the echo of Jesus saying, take up your cross and follow me, as we give up things and practice spiritual disciplines, let Jesus remind us not to be too comfortable not to be too comfortable with a world that prefers us be enemies with our neighbors rather than partners with our neighbors, a world that values the privilege of the individual over the love and connection of a neighbor. Let's not get too comfortable that there are people who are hungry, that there are people who can't find a place to live. Let's not be too comfortable with a world that lets people get ranked based on their importance or their value or their bank account or their worth. Let's not be too comfortable in a world where people are subject to judgment for how they look or speak or how capable they are of doing things or who they love. Let's not be too comfortable with a world that doesn't hope that everyone is given a second chance for the mistakes they make, no matter how egregious those mistakes may be. Let's not be too comfortable with a world that seeks to wield judgment against people. 
The image, the image of Jesus lifted up on the cross jars us, awakens us to stop our love of the world and to join the march to love the world, to join the Savior who come and says, do your deeds in God, forget Egypt. So we have a beautiful cross here at St. Paul. Let's take a moment and let this or any other cross or just the image of a loving Savior from John 3.16 remind us not to be too comfortable, that the world was not quick to love the Son back who came to love it. And we get to change as we journey from Egypt to the Promised Land, from Nazareth to Jerusalem, from the world we live in now to the world God wants to grant us in the kingdom of God. Faith calls us out of our comfort in the world as it is, into the adventure of finding and building the promised land. And Christ leads us on the way. Let's take a moment of silence and then I will pray for us to think about the ways that we are comfortable and the ways we are called to journey. God, inspire in us discomfort. The discomfort of the Spirit who comes into a room full of fishers and doctors and insurrectionists and rebels and farmers and women who comes into that room and says, you are the church, now go and love those around you. Give us discomfort when we see that love is not the word that rules the day. Give us discomfort when there are those who are hurting for a world that would rather crucify the Son of God than accept him. And call us into the journey of bringing the kingdom of God of loving those, of loving everyone, of being the body of Christ in the world. Give us this, this, the discomfort to know what it means to be disciples of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.
The cross means many things for us, but I hope that this week it will remind us not to be comfortable with the sickness we see in the world, but to work for the healing of our world in the name of Jesus Christ, who loves us and loves the world so much that he came and died on the cross. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.